What's up, guys? Today, we're going to be talking about selling with neuroscience with special guest Perry Sean. Perry is the award-winning author of Sell More with Sales Coaching, in addition to four other books on the topic of sales. Perry has over 20 years of professional speaking experience on the topic of sales and leadership. Her primary focus, of course, is leading and selling with neuroscience, which we'll be talking about today. Let's go ahead and jump right into the action. If, if you had to just give people advice on one thing in sales, just one thing, what would be the one thing that you would tell them? One thing I would say with sales would be to focus in on improving the quality of the questions that you ask, because the questions you ask are the GPS to your sales conversation. And if you're not asking great questions, you're not going to great places with your sales conversations. And I love the idea of question-based selling. In fact, um, something we say here a lot is you need to be listening far more than you're talking. And by asking questions, it creates that environment. And we yes. have a saying here, you should never talk so long that it drowns somebody. Meaning if you held their head underwater and you talk so long, they drowned, you talked way too much. So you need, <laughs> you need to let them come up for air, which means you need to let them come up to speak and talk. And you do that, yes. with, you do that with questions. So Yes. And, and I have a, f a philosophy that uh, ideally we don't want to be speaking more than four sentences at a time uh, with a client. Mm -hmm. And if we, um, because what I've done is been combing through the neuroscience with neuroscience grad students, four of them. And what we do is we look at what, what impacts a conversation. And then we then take that and we're testing it in the real world as to what works and what doesn't work. And what we've discovered, once you go beyond the four sentence, um, beyond four sentences, the, the, the client just seems to not be as engaged. So four sentences as a, as a golden rule uh, seems to be the piece. Because what we do is we test it with large sales teams that measure everything you can possibly imagine. The length of the conversation, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the purchasing, uh, how long to take to the time to talk about the product. They track everything. Mm -hmm. And we've discovered that it's the four sentence piece that really makes a difference. Interesting. Yeah. It's interesting because I think four sentences just off the top of my head is probably about 30 seconds of time, roughly. Yes. And that's about how long most people can hold their breath. So there you go. Yeah. It lines up there perfectly. You go. Yeah. So it works out <laughs> as, a, as a perfect balance. What are a few things that salespeople can do to get better, to, to personally develop? Personally develop one, uh, focus in on, you, you want to look at several parts of the conversations that get clunky. Okay. The first part of the conversation and how that starts, what's the question you're going to ask? And so work on those questions at the beginning. Uh, two, work on the transitions that you have in the conversation. How are you transitioning from asking the questions to talking about what, what it is that you sell? Okay. How do you transition from talking about what you sell to the remainder of that buying decision to help them with the logistics and all the rest? How do you transition to actually completing the conversation and looking at those components. Uh, what questions do you ask to actually confirm the sale? Uh, that to me is an important aspect that a lot of people have clunky. The other part is when we find that our close ratio is low, it is connected not just to what happens in that moment, it connects to what's happening in the beginning part of the conversation. So when I get called in for low clo close ratios, it's because that first part of that conversation isn't going well because the close will be easy if you line up the first part of the conversation well. What are a few characteristics of a top salesperson that are consistent with all top salespeople? Ah, great question. Because you can have introverts, extroverts, doesn't matter. Uh, the consistency, genuine curiosity, ability to ask questions, uh, great storyteller, but a concise storyteller, not a verbose storyteller. Um, and I believe that the interviews should be arranged that way. Most interviews are, uh, of salespeople are set up where you ask them questions and you get them talking. Those are not the skills you want demonstrated by a salesperson. Instead, reverse it. Ask them to come with questions to discover things about your business. And then that way, you will get to see the, the appropriate skills demonstrated during the interview process. Awesome. I have a, a sports background. So one thing I always relate to in sales is like you've mentioned, your top 10 questions and your transitions and your best stories, concise stories, yes. those are your plays. 
those are your plays. And so you should exactly. be practicing those plays. You should be going through yes. those plays in the car ride and when you're on yeah. a jog or whatever and practicing those plays so that when you're in the game, it's just, it's natural, right? And practice makes perfect. And, you know, yes. between the plays is when the customer's talking. And yes. that's where you're listening. But you want to have your play ready, you know, to transition. So I think those are good tips. I am so with you because, and, and it, actually you, inter, you mentioned an interesting part. In order, when they practice, body movement is an important part. So um, for the stories, the questions, all of it, to practice as you're moving, because what happens is the, the, it, something called whole brain learning, which is where you're activating as much of the brain as possible. Usually when we do things, when we're sitting still, we're only activating one, one, usually one hemisphere. Instead, when you move, the corpus callosum, which is the connective tissue between the right and the left hemisphere of the brain, activates the whole brain so that you're learning it and engaging it more so, so you'll be able to use it more effectively. It's just like as an athlete, um, my, I come from a family of, of, um, of runners, okay, and uh, professional runners. And so um, one of the things we used to learn was to practice beyond what is required for the game and so or for the track meet and so the same thing for the salesperson to practice beyond what is necessary so it's easy during the conversation um so that's easy to navigate absolutely yeah no it's interesting you say that because if i do um social media videos when i'm walking or even when i'm driving it can be easier it just rolls off the tongue smoother than just yes. sitting there trying to do it yeah. um so that's a good point and i think a good lesson to us all like if you can be selling while walking or even if you know you're on a zoom call you know i think that can be effective too because you kind of can see your own body language you can move around and create in that motion you know that movement uh, creates yeah. that emotion and that activity um, that you're looking for for both parties, I think. So yes. it's like a win-win. Yes, all the way around. Absolutely. So I guess uh, walk us through, what's the secret behind selling with neuroscience? What does that mean? What's the strategy? Well, the strategy is, and it really turns a lot of what we think about sales on its head. Um, because Quite often we think it's about getting someone to buy something or that we're doing it to them. Instead, to, the neuroscience shows that people actually have made the decision before they have the conversation with you, or at least a major component of their decision making before they speak with you. Uh, and setting up your sales structure so that they are reaching out and self-identifying helps you move them along that that spectrum of the buying decision. And so uh, what I often will share with, with business groups is I will ask them to pick something, you know, anything at all that they've purchased in the last year or so with the help of a salesperson. And then we qualify where the decision making is. And what we discover is that, let, let's say if we, we um, ask it, you know, are they 25% of their buying decision complete, 50% uh, 75 or 100 percent of their buying decision complete and meaning that you know at 75 percent they know they're going to buy they just don't know what uh 50 percent meaning 50 percent they could buy not buy their window shopping and then 100 percent you know they know exactly what product yeah. and um when i ask that question of groups as to you know where are you in your buying decision before you spoke to the salesperson uh, that you chose the example of 80 percent of the group says that they or, or more says that they're at 75 percent of their buying decision complete which is really neat in terms of you know because i'm a believer of what's the research say and let's test it and see if that's actually true um and then the the part that i love is that when you add the element of referral into it um like for example i'll ask a group you know what percentage of your buying decision was complete when you uh, um, you know, called when you were given a referral and you actually called that office. Mm -hmm. And generally it's a professional service of some kind. Um, the majority of the group, 80% or more, say 100%. And, okay. and so this gives us a, it makes the conversation different because then we're looking at where, you know, entering into the conversation, understanding that you've already made a good portion of the decision already. I know we have a policy in our household because of what I do um, is that we don't buy uh, from salespeople who aren't good at what they do. Okay. And <laughs> as like a, 
Yeah. And as a result, because we don't want to reinforce the wrong behavior, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so here we are. There's times when I so want to buy something, but I won't because of the salesperson. We've saved a lot of money in the household because of this. Um, but part of it is to recognize that there's other research um, that demonstrates that we actually unconsciously make the decision to buy. And then, it, then we only become aware of it consciously. So therefore, when we're asking the questions, that initial question that we ask is pivotal for the rest of the conversation, one, because people, every individual, whether they're conscious of it or not, they become conscious of it as we ask the questions, but they have criteria that they've used to get to that decision, usually the 75% mark. Mm -hmm. And so part of our job is to discover what some of that is so that then we can help them with, you know, what is it that's missing in their decision making? But too often salespeople will go back and, you know, treat you like you're at the 50% or the 25% of your buying decision complete, mm -hmm. um, which kind of makes it more of a clunky kind of sale. Right. Yeah, yeah, that actually, you know, is so accurate. We, we always say if you're well below the average opening ratio, which is your close rate, basically, that means you're actually talking people out of sales. And right. That's probably one of those situations where you actually lost the sale. You, you probably said too much or you were too aggressive or pushy or something along those lines. And like you yes. said, a certain number of people just don't buy from a bad salesperson. And so it's yes. about being a better salesperson, which is the whole point of, you know, what we're talking about here. So what would be yes. your pow power tips on that? You know, how, how do you avoid being the bad salesman and be, how do you be the good salesperson? Part of it, I think, is one, recognize that, you, you know, in this marketplace, even more than ever, trust is a major factor because what's happening is, you know, we're, we're in a, a downturn in the economy at this point in time. And in a downturn in the economy, people are still spending but they're just spending differently. And I think that's an important thing for us to recognize um, that even though the, the economy may have dropped a certain percentage, there's still the other percentage, whether it be 95, 98, 90, you know, 90, 2%, whatever that's the left in the economy is still there. It just means people are spending a little differently. And so part of it is for us, one, to get that in our mindset, that there is still spending. Um, and as we, as we recognize that, <laughs> an important factor, we have to recognize trust as a major component of the conversation. And not that you talk about trust, like say, trust me, that's the, that's the, the biggest flag that you're not trustable, but <laughs> it, instead to um, utilize, and I've been, I've been researching trust for more than 20 years, meaning my primary research that I've been doing. And what I've discovered is that there are actually 50 behaviors that someone can engage in in order to earn trust. And the number one, and you're not going to be surprised based on what you've shared with me so far, um, is that the number one behavior that comes back every time we do a study with a group or an organization uh, is one particular behavior in the 90 percentile, and that is, listen to me. Out of 50 different behaviors that we've been able to isolate, it's listen to me, which means then part of it is, and the, and the reason why I'm going back before we go forward into the tips is because the philosophy is important to understand before you set the parameters around a conversation. Right. So first, first off is, what is that first initial question? How does that question fit into the way in which your sales processes are set up so that you make that question as relevant as possible to how they came to you? That's one. Two, one of the things that I see so often, because I get the opportunity to listen to a lot of salespeople sell, is they um, start the conversation, you know, asking a few questions, and then they just switch automatically to talking about their product. And instead, what we like to do is set parameters that I, what percentage of the time are you actually speaking during the conversation versus the client? And we like to set a, a goal. Now, it depends on the product, but as a general rule, we like to set a, 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 a percentage number of the client should be speaking 70 to 75% of the time. 
That's the goal. And so as a salesperson, if I'm not, you know, if I'm, if I'm talking 50% of the time, then I have some work to do because I'm not truly understanding what's going on for the client. Um, and part of it, as you're asking the questions of the client, um, I'm not a believer of formulaic, you know, scripts, just because our trust meter goes off, you know, we, we, we can, I know when I'm, when it's being done to me versus me engaging in a conversation. Right. And in that dynamic, what are the questions that you ask? I often ask groups um, of salespeople to write out your 10 best questions. And most struggle to get to 10, which is, hmm. Interesting. Uh, now, yes, things will naturally flow in a conversation, but there should be certain ones that you're aiming for. About We know that people make decisions emotionally and logically, okay? They use the logic to justify the decision. So, but the, the ability to ask, depending on the industry, um, the ability to ask those questions that engage emotionally, that changes in the conversation. So depending on what industry they're in, to be aware of that. So have questions on both categories, looking at what's a personal win for the individual, what's a professional win for the individual, and understanding that dynamic in the conversation. So being able to navigate, and I call it being a, a, a sales conversation ninja, you know, to be able to adapt to the conversation, to be truly present for the client and understand what's going on in their world and what are their reasons for wanting a solution, whatever that is that you're offering. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think you hit on some good points, you know, where I think in the old days, people didn't have as many resources to do research up front. You know, there wasn't social media, there wasn't websites, all these things. So the right. sales process needed to cover more ground and that created, you know, an element of, you know, you could call it a little more aggressive sales or pushy sales. Whereas nowadays people really aren't even reaching out until they reach a certain threshold of understanding, which that understanding right. is coming from the website and now a huge piece of social media. So businesses that aren't, you know, active on social media are really missing out because that right. in my mind is, is completing the 75% of the sale for your team so that when they get to your team, there's only 25% to go. And right. so, you know, questions and listening is trying to understand what is that 25%? Mm -hmm. like, explain that to me so that I can understand that we can, you know, reach your objective. And one of the questions I always like to ask at the beginning was, you know, what's the perfect outcome for you? You know, what are you looking for? Like, what's the perfect world? Help me understand that, right? Because Great you know, questions. You, yeah. yeah, you know, if you can make that happen, then that's a win, you know? So, yes. um, and then just asking why, like, don't just, a lot of salespeople will ask a question and get the answer. And then that's like green light. I'm going to run with this thing for the next hour. Whereas yeah. in, instead they don't follow up with, why is that important to you? Why, why that outcome, you know, like yes. gain, gain more understanding. And I've yeah. always found, you know, leads, uh, need a certain amount of questioning to break the ice. And then once you do that, though, they sometimes will talk for 45 straight minutes. You know, all yes. you need to do is listen. And at the end of it, you generally get the sale. So I think those are all great points. Yes. And one of the things that we found really helpful uh, with regards to social media is that first question that you ask is what was it? So if, they're com if you know that they're coming through social media, then ask the question. So what was it in that you, you know, saw, read, watched, whatever it is, depending on the, where they're coming from, mm. that spoke to you most? Because then that lets you know some of the criteria that they're using, because they may have consumed, you know, a huge amount of material, but you want to know what's that piece that really spoke to them, because that tells you part of the criteria and is a great entry point for the conversation. Oh, I love that. And that also tells you what to create more content about, right? Right. <laughs> do more of what's working and less of what's not. That's what we always say. Yes. So. Yes. I think that's huge. And, and the same kind of question that I think that, you know, piggybacks off that is what made you choose us? You know, what, what made, what compelled you to reach out to us? You know, I yes. think it's good too, and kind of help you maybe stand out, you know, what, what makes you look different out there and then leverage that, you know, um, I exactly. Think it's so um, those are all, those are all great, uh, great tips, great information. Um, what else would you share if you had a group of 20,000 small businesses in the audience across, you know, all kinds of verticals from e-commerce yes. to local businesses, what would be some of those like principles that would apply to every one of those organizations in some capacity 
when it comes to their sales team? What kind of value can, can you provide there? I think there? one of the things that a lot of, um, a lot of organizations don't um, set up within their organization, that when they do, when we help them set it up, it makes such a difference. And that is because marketing and sales are partners, okay? And we sometimes treat them as separate entities. The ideal thing to do with your sales is through the sales conversations that the team is having, track the issues that the clients have. And you may say, well, of course, Perry, but it's what you do with it that's most important. Because each week, if the team was tracking that and then they're reporting it to their manager or whoever to be able to utilize it, because then that information is gold because it's real time information. One, you know, what we read in the you know, business journals or, or professional journals in our whatever industry is information that is usually months old, at least a month. But the information you get from your team is real time. And that, then that information, whatever those issues are, then goes into the marketing, the content marketing. Because that then becomes... What happens is that spectrum that I was talking about in the terms of their buying decisions, it helps move the clients further along in that buying decision. So the team's conversations are more effective and more efficient and most likely shorter. Okay. And so that doing that as a consistent thing every single week to inform the marketing of what are the issues that are going on in our marketplace right at this moment and be responsive to it in your marketing makes a big difference in terms of driving profits. No, that's a great tip because, you know, those are just eliminating those roadblocks, right? When you, if you don't know what the roadblocks are, then you're always hitting those speed bumps. But if you right. do, then you can make those revisions and adjustments. And that reminds me too, I think there's good questions to be asked at the end too, particularly when you lose a deal. I think the great, great question there that we always recommend is just ask, hey, you know what? I always wanna be a better salesperson. What could I have done different to earn your business? You know, What could I have done better? And get that feedback personally, because a lot of times that'll help identify areas that you can improve too. And it also helps keep that bridge open so yes. ultimately you never want to burn a bridge because maybe things yes. don't work out the other direction they go. They're going to come back to you first. Yes. Great. And I, I, I would uh, piggyback on that with an additional question and that because what we're looking at during the conversation is where is the client with us and where, where do we lose them? Mm -hmm. And so to uh, sometimes ask the question of, oh, where did I lose you in the conversation? Mm. And the reason why is that's more a, a, a specific way to get to, because if they're looking to give you feedback, they may not, you know, people aren't always comfortable with negative uh, feedback. You know, like, what did I do? They may not be as open, but if you ask a second question, then they know that you really are interested in hearing that, you know, I'm wanting to get as much feedback as possible, could you tell me where I, where I lost you? And to me, part of it is genuine curiosity as a, that's the biggest skill set that you want in a salesperson is the ability to be curious because that puts them in the, in the position to be in the question, uh, to be able to ask those you know, more effectively. Why is sales important? Wow, that's a big question. Uh, sales is important because it's, a, I define sales as helping, other, uh, helping people with their buying decisions. And it's the decision-making that drives business. It's the relationship. I'm, I'm, I'm a believer that all business is a byproduct of relationship. And so therefore, how do you build that relationship? And that's through the, the connection with people. And that is, I mean, it drives our economy. And, so relationship and business, yeah. I love it. Your de definition is similar to mine. Mine is sales is just convincing somebody to do something that's better for them. And it mm. doesn't even need to be money exchanged. It, sales is just the process of convincing somebody to do something that's better for them. And if it's not better for them, then you shouldn't even sell it. So you right. need to understand what they're looking for. And if you have a product that fits that need, you should sell mm -hmm. it with everything you have, right? Yes. Um, so yeah. I love that. Well, thanks, Perry. I really appreciate everything today. Uh, maybe you can just leave us with telling us how we can learn more and how we can connect with you. 
Great. Uh, people can connect with me through uh, LinkedIn very easily, Perry Sean. I, the other is I have a Facebook group, which is specifically around sales, which I call Selling with Science and Soul. Uh, mm -hmm. And also our website, which is uh, the coachingandsalesinstitute.com.